Welcome to this third lecture. Today we cover geometry. There are four parts. In part A we look at the question what is geometry? Here's an attempt of a definition. A geometry is the science of shape, size and symmetry. An example of a shape is a triangle, an example of a size is the area of a disk, an example of a symmetry is a rotational symmetry like an eightfold symmetry seen here. This picture of uh, Barbari illustrates all these three parts. There's a compass on the table to measure angles. There are shapes in the form of polyhedra and geometric figures with symmetry. Using symmetries to distinguish geometries is the point of view of Klein's Erlang program. Felix Klein was an important geometer himself and also a historian. Here are three examples. When we look at transformations which preserve lines, there is a group generated by linear transformations and translations. A triangle goes over to a triangle, but angles and lengths of the sides can change. In Euclidean geometry, one can only rotate, translate and reflect an object. And the lengths and angles are preserved. An extreme, much wider geometry is when we are allowed to take transformations which also can stretch and bend. It is a kind of geometry, but uh, so important that it has its own name. It's called topology. <coughs> So let's look at some examples of shapes. Triangles, circles, polygons appear in school geometry. As the example of a polygon in the shape of a horse shows, polygons can be quite complicated. A computer stores a shape in the form of polygons. Here's examples of shapes in space. They are obtained by intersecting some solid hyperboloids. And here we see polyhedra. Uh, which have entered the landscape of shapes early on in geometry. The study of polyhedra is still a research topic today, especially in higher dimensions. Geometric shapes also appear in art and architecture. Here are two shapes created with the help of a computer by an architect, Hans Meyer. And here are some more familiar shapes which appear often in calculus courses. You see hyperboloids, paraboloids, cylinder, torus, and some other candies. Uh, smooth geometry, geometric objects can be approximated also with discrete networks. That's how a computer keeps track of shapes. Computer vision is part of computer science. It's related to the science of perception. We see here an impossible cube, the Escher cube. And here's an animation of this cube, which recently surfaced on YouTube. It looks like an impossible object, but it's actually uh, possible to realize it even as a connected object. Shapes are also important in modern geography and mapping software like Google Earth. Here's a picture of Richard Rommel from Harvard and match it with the situation today by placing the camera in Google Earth at the same spot. The second part of the definition of geometry was that it deals with sizes. Computing the area of a circle or the area of a trapezoid are geometric problems. These problems have been solved already early on. The area of a trapezoid has been computed almost 4,000 years ago in the Moscow Papyrus. The area of the circle was tackled only by Archimedes. Also, the computation of length is a geometric problem. The circumference of a circle or the distance between two points are example problems. Distance problems could be tackled only with Pythagoras' theorem, a result which we will look at later in this lecture. Also, volume computations were done early. Archimedes' best result was the computation of the volume of a sphere. But computing volumes can be tricky. The intersection of three hyperboloids uh, with perpendicular axes leads to the shape to the left. The computation of the volume is quite tricky. A third uh, ingredient of geometry is symmetry. This is Klein's point of view. So here are three examples of symmetries, reflection symmetry, rotation symmetry, and scaling symmetry. It appears that the scaling symmetry cannot be realized in the same object, but there are examples of objects which realize this, self-similar object, or objects like drawn by Escher. <clears throat> so here come to art, a world uh, which uh, uh, has been realized by an artist self-similar world. You dry, dive into the, the, the world and uh, you end up at the same spot where you have uh, started the journey. <clears throat> and uh, finally, 
uh, here is uh, 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 also nature, loves symmetry. Here's a picture of Ken Liebrecht, also from Caltech. He has also written books about snowflakes. And architecture symmetry is important. Here's an example, another example. Uh, pop artists like M.C. Escher made a trade uh, of symmetry. Here we see him painting one of his pictures. And finally, again, back to nature. One could think that these creatures were invented, but these are drawings of Ernst Haeckel. In this part B, we look at some special points in the triangle, then learn about the beautiful theorem of Thales. Uh, these are, first we start with a few smaller miracles, four basic miracles in the triangle. The first is the centroid. If we take the side bisectors in a triangle and connect them with the opposite vertex, we get three lines. There is no a priori reason why they should intersect, but they do. The second surprise comes when we intersect the altitudes in a triangle. They all intersect in a common point, the orthocenter. It is important to appreciate that this is not obvious. The third miracle appears if we intersect the perpendicular bisectors of the three sides in a triangle. Again, this intersects in a point. The last surprise comes when we look at the angle bisectors in a triangle. Again, they intersect in a common point. Here are computer-assisted proofs. You can just run these lines with Mathematica and you get in each case a verification that the proof uh, works. An amazing theorem can be found, uh, has been found by the first mathematician, Thales of Milet. Uh, surprisingly, it is rarely taught in geometry courses, and if and only in a special case where it is not that interesting. Thales lived around 600 BC. Note that this is long before Euclid. He drew triangles into circle and noticed a strange thing. Before we come to that, one has to appreciate the person, as Thales was not only a mathematician, but also a philosopher. He thought that space is the greatest thing as it contains all things. In some sense, he anticipates the notion of a universe, which we still today try to understand. Here's the theorem. Pick two points AB on a circle and draw the line segment. Now pick a third point and draw the triangle. This defines an angle at C. If you move the point C, the angle does not change. We will in class look at the proof and in the homework you uh, uh, will write down a detailed proof. A special case, which is often taught, is rather plain. It tells us that if AB is a diameter, then the angle at C is a right angle. But this is rather obvious if you double the triangle to get the rectangle. The more general Thales theorem, however, is remarkable because it is not obvious. These are the parts of mathematics we live for. So here is an animation done with Mathematica. In this last side we see some of the Greek geometers and philosophers. Thales was the first. We will today look at the theorem of Pythagoras also and a related theorem of Hippocrates. We have mentioned already Archimedes before, and Plato, after whom the Platonic solids are named. Socrates and Aristotle were primarily philosophers, but they were also excellent mathematicians. In this third part of the third lecture, we look at the famous Pythagoras theorem. It is probably the most important theorem in mathematics. While some examples of the theorem have been known by Babylonian mathematicians, it was only around 500 BC that the theorem really was discovered and proven. The theorem is named after a charismatic leader who not only was a mathematician, but kind of a spiritual leader. In the painting of Raphael, the school of Athens, some famous mathematicians and philosophers are united. We see Pythagoras to the left. Let's go to the theorem. The sum of the squares of the two shorter sides of a right angle triangle is the square of the length of the hypotenuse. Pythagoras comes from Samos, belonging more to the east than to the west. 
while the Babylonians only knew examples. The first proof came around 500 BC. It was written down and popularized in the book of Euclid. In 1969 already 367 proofs were known. Here's the first proof. Now we have a square on the hypotenuse and we can of course relate that by calculation to the squares on the two shorter sides. But we don't need any calculation. A small game such as children and mathematicians play will transpose that triangle there and this triangle here. And now we've constructed an L-shaped figure with the same area, of course, because made of the same pieces, whose size we can see at once in terms of the smaller sides of the triangle. Let me put that divider down. Then it's clear to you that there is now a square here on the shorter side of the triangle and a square here on the longer of the two sides enclosing the right angle. Pythagoras had proved that not just for the 345 triangle or any Babylonian triangle, but for every triangle, the square on that hypotenuse is equal to the square on here and the square on here, if and only if that angle is a right angle. To this day, that remains the most important single theorem in the whole of mathematics. That seems an extraordinary thing to say. But it's because it's the first time that the structure of nature is translated into numbers. And the exact fit of the numbers describes the exact laws that bind the universe. When Pythagoras had proved the great theorem, he offered a hundred oxen to the muses in thanks for the inspiration. It's a gesture of pride and humility together, such as every scientist feels to this day when the numbers dovetail and say, this is part of the key to the structure of nature herself. The proof uh, just explained in the movie is here again. So we partition and rearrange to get from one square two squares. Now here's a 3D printable proof. So we have all three, all two steps. And uh, let's look at the second proof. Uh, it appears in the book of Eves. I animated it with Mathematica. What happens is this uh, deformation of a rectangle into a parallel parallelogram doesn't change the area and then also moving these parallelograms doesn't change the area and then again we move them back to become um, squares. Here are two experiments which have been done in the classroom. Uh, Smolian uh, suggests to should I give uh, bake some cake or uh, cookies and uh, in the form of Pythagoras theorem and then ask the students whether they would like to have the uh, big uh, uh, square or the two small squares. Another experiment uh, which was has been done is to, to give students a lot of triangles and then uh, ask them to compare a square and b square and c square. And uh, what happened once that uh, uh, one of the students was uh, reporting that uh, it, it's remarkable that a square plus b square plus minus c square is always close to zero but never zero. So it's an anti Pythagorean theorem. But the ideas have uh, uh, flown forth and back from Asia to Europe. 
The Pythagoras proof was first written down in a mathematical text uh, called Zhu Bi Zhang Ying. There are generalizations of the theorem. Uh, I myself have a little bit contributed to a generalization. A generalization of Cauchy Bine, which itself can be seen as a generalization of Pythagoras. Uh, and uh, Pythagoras sacrificed 100 oxen. I contemplated how to honor it. Cows, Swiss cows especially, were too expensive. But I had chickens at that time. This is Newton, one of my chickens I had a few years ago. Like Pythagoras, one has to make a sacrifice. But then I changed my mind. Instead of a sacrifice, also a hawk does the job. Finally, let's look at the result, which is also historically important and which builds from Pythagoras' theorem. It's due to Hippocrates, of course, who lived after Pythagoras. The theorem relates two areas, the area of a triangle and the area of two moons. It is remarkable that it is the first quadrature of a curvilinear area. Here's an animation. Let's work out the proof during class. This is the end. In this fourth part, we look at a few more results. It can be a motivation to dwell more into geometry. We look at five cool results. The first one is Pappus' theorem from projective geometry. Take two lines and three points on each line, then form the connection points. We have always three points on a line. Uh, here's the mystic hexagram. We pick six points on an ellipse then formed connection lines, like in the Pappus theorem. Again, we have points on a line. And this is the butterfly theorem. It is described in the book, The Mathematician and Mathematician's Brain by David Ruel. Start with the line segment seen in red, form two other line segments through the middle. This gives the butterfly shape. Uh, now, the line segments segment cuts the triangles in equal lengths. And here is the Feuerbach nine point circle. We have the pedal points of the altitudes, the side by sectors, as well as the midpoints between altitude meeting point and the vertices. They all lie on a circle called the Feuerbach circle or nine point circle. And this is the Morley miracle. Trisect each angle of a triangle uh, we get the intersection get intersection points which are located on an equilateral triangle this is the end